I like that six fantastic introduction. That's gone down really, really well. <laughs> you know, I love you because you're like me. You speak your mind. But the difference between you and me is you don't get fired all the time for it. I seem to. Well, I have been fired, actually. I was fired when I was doing live TV. Uh, and I was fired when my at the very start of my journalistic career. I was on the Daily Mail and they were a broadsheet newspaper then. They went from broad, broadsheet down to tabloid and I was fired then. But in both cases, I had other work lined up. So it wasn't exactly really, really bad news. Um, so I have been fired, yeah. There always seems to be a little glint in your eye that a lot of people seem to miss. And there seems to be a lot of tongue in cheek with Janet Street Porter, yet people take you incredibly seriously, don't they? Oh, I think a lot of people, a certain kind of bloke finds me really, really threatening. And I think when I started off in journalism back uh, in the at the end of the 1960s, I think people did find me quite worrying because there weren't a lot of people who talked like me. And I mean, it's hard for people to believe now, but I actually started out on the radio, on uh, Radio 4, on the Jack Demanio show. And I used to uh, do quite a lot of broadcasting for the BBC at the end of the 60s and um, didn't attract much comment. Uh, and then I was working in Fleet Street as a columnist. And then in 1973, when commercial radio started in Britain, I was there from day one, two hours every morning. And, you know, people just went mad. I mean, all the people who were looking for a reason to hate me certainly wrote in. <laughs> do you like being you? Because I get the feeling you don't take yourself incredibly seriously. You enjoy what you do. You're picky and choosy about what you do. And you have fun with it. Yeah, well, I'm in the lucky position now where I don't have to do any rubbish and I only do the things that <laughs> I on, like You're sat doing. here with me. What are you talking oh, about? No. Well, this has taken months to set up. <laughs> um, uh, when I started out as a journalist, I was always uh, careful to do more than one job at once. I was very, very ambitious because I suppose I'd studied architecture and I was going to be an architect and then I took a year off and I became a journalist um by accident I hadn't intended it to be my real career I enjoyed it so much and within a year I got this job on the Daily Mail and I didn't really look back but after that I was careful to also do loads of freelance work loads of radio work I wrote for magazines and then when I went onto the radio I was on the radio in the mornings and I edited a magazine in the afternoons and I think I've always had that attitude where I enjoy work tremendously and I like doing a whole variety of work got very very short attention span uh, and it's really been a fantastic career I mean it's still going on I've got loads and loads of telly work now uh, which is nice is there one thing that you still love more than everything else and if you were offered it on equal money you'd do that no because I've edited a national newspaper when I edited the independent on Sunday and that was a tremendous job for me it, it encompassed all the things that I like, you know, lots of deadlines, lots of opportunities to issue orders. <laughs> you know, you could be a bit of a megalomaniac if you're an editor because you are choosing what's on the front page, you are setting the news agenda, and I really, really enjoyed it. And also, if people think that I can't do something, I generally prove them wrong. And of course, I'd started out in journalism and then gone on to radio and then on to television. But when I was offered this job of editing The Independent on Sunday, I got so much carping from jury people like um, journalists on the Telegraph and people in private. I kind of implied that I wouldn't be able to do it. And then ghastly people like Andrew Neal said, oh, well, I don't know how, you know, you don't seem to have any qualifications <laughs> until I pointed out to him that I had actually presented the same political programme as him for the BBC for an entire year. Um, I like to prove people wrong. And that's uh, been the kind of driving force in my life. And when people said, oh, she'll never be able to edit a national newspaper. Well, not only did I edit, edit it successfully, but I put the circulation up. But I think with a challenge like that, you can only do it for so long because it takes over your entire life. And what I really, really like doing is what I'm doing at the moment. I write two newspaper columns a week. I write books. I do a load of TV work. And I do radio, so I kind of do a bit of everything. Were you always tenacious? Did you always have that drive to succeed? Yes, 
I was a completely repulsive child. <laughs> I was very, very, very <laughs> driven. I worked at the library uh, when I was at school. I worked after school in the library. I belonged not in just one quiz team. I belonged in two quiz teams. I was in the Young Conservatives and then the Young Socialists, kind of more or less one after the other. I was just looking for things to compete at. I was at the tennis team at school, the rounders team, you know. I am very, very competitive. I've got that a bit more under control now. Um, I suppose even as a teenager, I wanted to be successful. I just didn't know at what. You can't really be in anybody's pockets, can you? No, you've got to have a clear idea of what you're interested in and the paper's got to reflect that. I think the other thing is that you've got to listen to the points of view of everybody who works for you, but you're not operating in a collective. You know, you've got to stamp your authority on what you do. I sense from you and what you said in the last 15 minutes that you do love power and you do love control. At what point do you stop that? Because that could become an obsession in your private life as well as your career. It's a difficult balance that, isn't it? Yeah, well, I've always said there's only uh, two ways to do things in life, my way and the wrong way. (laughs) (laughs) And that certainly does apply to all uh, my homes, uh, yeah, and how I run things. Yeah, definitely. I mean, when I was a television executive, I used to um, dream up ideas for TV shows and I had quite big teams of people working for me. I mean, when I was at the BBC... uh, at the uh, beginning of the 90s, I had about 250 people working for me and I used to say to people, well, you can do it my way and if there's any time left over, we'll have a look at doing it your (laughs) way. (laughs) Interestingly, I don't know whether you're going to give me a slap for this, but it seems to me you were very popular, then you kind of slumped a little bit and went quiet and now you're cool. I'm cool, yeah. I think when you get to my age, I mean, I'm 61, I think what happens is there are whole decades when you're doing really good work, but you're out of fashion. So, for example, in the 80s, I created this television series, Network 7, that was so of the moment. I mean, it won loads of awards. It was completely hip and happening. But around the time we made it, and I created it with uh, this woman, Jane Hewland, around the time we made it, we couldn't really get written about. And magazines like Vogue, they didn't want to know. And then a year later, they oh, right, she's fashion. And so it doesn't always time with when you think you deserve it. Of course, after live TV, I got slagged off again. And then I kind of went into a kind of worthy phase. And now I suppose I can't, quite explain what's happened now I think in 2004 I did I'm a Celebrity Get Me Out of Here uh, and I just did it for the crack really I mean I've created loads of reality TV shows so I wanted to be on one I didn't really have any fear of what might happen on it Um it did me the most tremendous amount of good because before I'm a celebrity, I could be on Question Time, I could be on political shows, I could be on worthy, to, I made worthy documentaries, but it kind of introduced me or reintroduced me back to a much wider audience, the mass market, if you like. And since then, I've done a lot of television work that's really in the mainstream, things like The F Word with Gordon Ramsay, and at the moment I'm doing Grand Designs, a new series of Grand Designs with Kevin MacLeod. Um, and people really, really do recognise me in a way, on the street in a way that they didn't 10 years ago. I think reality TV for a star like yourself who is well established can be your best friend or your worst enemy. If you go on there and try and act, they'll see straight through you because they can't keep it up. You can't possibly keep it up for the entire series. When you're smart like you and you just go on and be you and you don't come across as always obnoxious and you're actually very funny and have a sense of humour, it does open people's eyes and it brings you a whole different new audience and it's done you good it hasn't done everybody good though has it no it hasn't and i was on with paul burrell and i don't think it really did him any good whatsoever i mean he just came across as this big girl's blouse you know flapping his arms around dying his shirt pink and singing songs from musicals and you know with all this rubbish about princess diana and the queen's corgis you just thought i'll get a life And I think people saw that in a difficult situation, I am really, really practical. And before the programme, I'd been um, to Australia on a very long 
track in the outback I'd walked I've done this Lara Pinta trail out of Valley Springs uh, so I'd done like an eight day trek in very extreme uh, conditions so I was ready to go into the jungle and also I can cook <laughs> and I took over the cooking so it was that was a bit of a laugh it wasn't just the cooking you took over let's be honest well I was a bit bossy yeah but I, I took over portion control <laughs> Do you know how I see you? I see you as like a female Stephen Fry. And I hope you take that as a compliment. I'd love to be in your brain for just one minute because I'm such a dumbo. I know nothing. I've not been anywhere. I've not experienced anything. I have no talent. And just to have your stories would be great. And I think the same as Stephen. That I'd love to have dinner with him just to get those stories. You're never going to talk about them on here and who can blame you. But what a life you've had. Are you even amazed at your success and your longevity? I think I've been really good at reinventing myself and not thinking oh you know there are things I don't do I mean my agents always amazed because sometimes they send me uh, proposals of ideas for me and they say you won't want to do that now if somebody says to me you won't want to do it I always think <laughs> well why not like a couple of years ago I did a series where I drove a London taxi I really really liked that because uh, it gave me a chance to overtake all those white van men <laughs> on the inside uh, and I did another series where I taught um, children in primary school and I did a series where I had to deliver babies and um, I was a trainee midwife in <laughs> Barnsley Hospital and I got no maternal instincts whatsoever. That was a very, very big challenge. So I like doing things I haven't done before and I like doing things that I can write about and that also give me an insight into how other people live. I think you're curious, aren't you? And I think to do the newspaper stuff and be the great journalist that you are, you have to just be nosy and curious and always thinking and always looking and always asking questions, even if it's just in your brain. Yeah, well, I write opinion columns. So you've got to write two opinion columns a week. You've got to have done things or experienced things that you can react to. Otherwise, you're just going around in circles. I suppose one of the things about me is I have got an opinion about absolutely everything. When... I did my one-woman show in the Edinburgh Festival and then I toured it around Britain. People kept saying at the end of it, why don't you run for Parliament? Why aren't you a politician? And I went, because I'd be a dictator, that's why. <laughs> All right, we're going to take another piece of music, then we will talk about the book. I'm going to try and think of a way of saying it. Got a new book out called Life's Too Flipping Short. I presume yeah. that's what it stands for. Yes, well, there's the F word in the title. I think I chose the title of the book because it's one of my favourite sayings when people ask you to do things you're not going to do or suggest ludicrous uh, ways of spending your time. And I'm very much a person that thinks, you know, life is too short to do X, Y and Z. And also, over the last couple of years, I've noticed this increase in newspapers and magazines of all this advice directed at people about there's even a column called How to Be Happy. And this is just utter bilge. And I wanted to write a book to say to people that you've got it within yourself to do anything you want to do because I've done it. And believe me, I haven't got a degree. I'm not the most glamorous woman on the block. I speak my mind. And I, the only thing I can tell you is you, you've got to believe in yourself. And this book is about, you know, few top tips from me like wake up in the morning and tell yourself you're great because no one else is going to <laughs> and uh, it's done very well I tell you my top two life's too short things would be to clean a car and clean an oven I don't see the point why people would stand every Sunday outside their house cleaning a car when there's a very good car wash for £1.99 I don't get that no, I don't get that. And also, I like going to the car wash because I can get gossip and talk to the blokes down the car wash. <laughs> so you can kind of do two things uh, to kill two birds with one stone. It's like people say, well, if you think life's too every short to do this, that and the other, why do you do things like go to the post office? Well, like today, I went to the post office to renew my freedom pass. And I did it so I can talk to the bloke at the counter about how all the staff feel about, you know, the people running the post office and blah. You get loads of stuff that way. I think you've got to be careful in life that you just don't cut things out that are quite important. And in the book, I say the most important things to you are belief in yourself and a good circle, a small circle of friends. And I have a whole chapter in the book about friendship, who's your real friend, who's your fake friend. I hate friends reunited with that idea of being friends with these, you know, ghastly people you were at school with. No way. I mean, I want real friends and also 
real friends are really important because they tell you the bad news, don't they? They mm. tell you when your ass looks big in those trousers. <laughs> they tell you when you've got a horrible <laughs> dress on or something. You know, it's friends like that you really need. I read that chapter and I got out my mobile phone and deleted about 32 numbers because I realised that these people just rang me when they wanted something or if they wanted information. And I thought, these people are never ringing me to find out how I am or what I'm doing or what I'm up to. They just want info or they want a favour. They're not friends, are they? No, they're not friends. And I, I've, I've tried to say in the book, cull. Cull, cull, cull. Get rid of these people that you don't see from one year to the next. You know, why are you being friends with them? It's just no point. And the other thing is, I suppose, to make sure that you have friends who give back what you know it's not a kind of you don't you're not trading it's not like carbon offsetting or stuff like that but you know only have friends who don't just burden you with all their troubles it's got to be a two-way traffic but i've found my friends i suppose in modern society friends have replaced our family for a lot of people and i am very very loyal uh, to my friends uh, uh, and I've had the same group of friends for a long time but I do cull as you say the ones that just want something my other problem is my openness and my willingness to communicate I say way too much and tell people far too much and it always ends up biting me on the backside. well now Alex you do not want to be texting or sending too many emails i mean life is too short to keep stabbing away at a phone sending all these ludicrous texts and what is it about emails we like over communicate don't we we pretend we're communicating but we're just sending emails and then what about all this time you waste on the internet i mean i like the internet i like buying things on the internet i like browsing but you've got to ration it You've just got to be ruthless. I mean, at the end of the day, what you really, really want to do is read a book, watch a bit of rubbish television, or best of all, cook something. You know, give some time back to yourself because I just think women in particular spend their entire lives looking after other people, listening to what their partners want and trying to work out how to deliver a proportion of that. They spend too much time trying to please too many other people. The boss, the partner, the children, the family, their mother. And in the end, you've got to get up, you've got to say, I'm great, because no one else is going to say it. And you've got to end the day thinking you've done one thing in that day for yourself. What if you're not great? And what if you're a lazy loser that actually does need a wake-up call? Waking up in the morning and telling yourself you're fabulous is not necessarily the answer, is it? I don't think most women do that. <laughs> Let me, yeah, that's the difference between us. Most women wake up and they just think, ugh. I've got to do this, I've got to do that, I've got to... Oh, and they make lists that are far too long. That's the other thing I say in the book. If you're writing a list that's got more than six people, uh, six uh, items on it, forget it. You'll never, ever manage to do them. So just do things that are achievable. When you talk about friends, it's interesting because in life we're conditioned to be popular and want to be popular. And a sign of our success is how many friends we've got and how many people on our Facebook. I don't have MySpace and Facebooks. I don't want any part of it because to me it's fakery. It's not well, real. They're not real friends. They're cyber friends, aren't they? They're completely fake. I'm not on Facebook or any of that. I've got a I've got a website, JanetStreetPorter.com, and it's not interactive because, quite frankly, life's too short. And why would you want to communicate with people you don't know and you don't like? And it's only really age and wisdom and reading a book like this that wakes you up to think, why am I actually on the phone with this person? Well, I've had a lot of letters from women who've bought my book and some emails too. And they've been really great because they know I've got a short attention span and they know I don't suffer fools. But they say <laughs> things like, Janet, don't hang up or Janet, don't delete this email. Yeah, I've read your book. It made me laugh so much. I bought six copies for my friends and then some women have actually sent me the proof of the purchase <laughs> to say, I have bought six copies of your book. I bought 10 copies for all my friends. We laughed so much. I passed it on. And what I, I want to do with the book is make people laugh because that is, you know, I hate all these guides to life that are so serious. I mean, in the end, you've got to get up and you've got to have one laugh in every day. And if you can't laugh with the person you're with, 
been them. You're quite right that we now seem to need a psychologist on every corner to guide us through our day from boiling a kettle to living our life. We are really overindulged in self What about these bloody life coaches? I mean, what other complete <laughs> road of rubbish is that? So you're going you're gonna to spend 50 quid an hour on this person who's going to ring you up. They're not even going to come and see you. They're going to ring you up and tell you how to rearrange your life. Well, read by book, you can do it all by yourself. I mean, first of all, if you're with someone who doesn't value them, value you, get rid of them. It's as simple as that. I mean, I've had four husbands and I don't suffer fools. I tell you, you know those life coaches, they seem to be like those mucky phone lines where you ring up and you think you're talking to Pamela Anderson and actually you're talking to 82-year-old Gladys in Bolton or something. You know. Well, I wouldn't know. Oh, well, I wouldn't, well, I've never been on those other kind of phone lines that you clearly have. <laughs> all right, let's take a piece of music and I'll tell you all about it during the... We have a lot of things around us that we don't need. We have a lot of people around us that we don't need. And the essence of life is really simple. Get up in the morning, smile, eat and go to bed. Mm, absolutely. And also I've got a section in the book about going for a job. I think a lot of people, women in particular, feel really intimidated about their CVs. And I say it's illegal now to ask you your age, so don't give it. Or if you have to give it, lie. Qualifications, lie. I mean, who checks up on all these qualifications? But what you have got to put a lot of work into when you go for a job is talking about your interests, what motivates you and how you're going to play in a team and how you come to decisions, you know, and what your priorities are. And that's far more important than whether you've got A-level Latin or, you know, an O-level in human biology. Help me with this one then. When you go for a job and you get it, what is the difference between being assertive and a pain in the backside and everybody hates you? All right. Women who know what they want are a pain in the backside and assertive. Men who uh, are like that are decisive. No, 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 no. You see, you're doing this feminine... Look, I wasn't it's asking true. male... Women know what they want. They're decisive. Women are bossy. Janet, you mustn't keep going on about this male-female divide. It's not a big problem oh, so anymore. so Alan Sugar can get away with being the way he is on the television. People find that absolutely entertaining. Yes. I find it sexist, Neanderthal, offensive, you know. But it's entertainment, Janet. You, you, you really mustn't confuse the issues. Oh, well, I don't find it very entertaining, I've got to say. I mean, my experience as a female boss and as a woman that's operated uh, throughout her entire career in a man's world is that men have a very, very different way of running businesses and doing business to women. And it's no uh, surprise that most of the new businesses in Britain are started by women. And the reason for that is they want to run a business differently to the way they had to work before because as a woman as you ride rise up through the pyramid of power in a big organization you become aware of very uh, a few very important facts one is men have a way of talking to each other which we just do not understand they talk all this jargon about football about parking rugby sport it all like you know fills up loads of blather also men have loads more meetings than women ever have because women can multitask we can have a meeting we can do something else at the same time but actually we don't want to waste time having unnecessary meetings so I've experienced the world of work where I've had to keep my mouth shut believe it or not and just fit in and I'm not surprised that women often take the huge risk of starting their own business because they just want to do it differently now stay calm when I ask you this question but is there still a major problem between men and women in the workplace in your honest opinion well, I've upset, uh, to be honest, I've absented myself from the workplace because I write two newspaper columns a week from home. And if I went back into the workplace, I would find it um, quite strange. I think men still more or less do run most newspapers. They're not women at the top of every single newspaper, but although it's improved. I think the other thing is that as a woman who's... Uh, 61, I have to accept that if I go into the office, I'm not going to be the centre of attention. There'll be some blonde bimbo, some talentless twerp who writes a column <laughs> about, you know, green issues or something, and the editor will find her a million times more interesting than me, and I just have to accept that. You don't only have a problem with us as men, you have a problem with your own sex. Is it just anybody other than you you sometimes have a problem No, with? I don't have a problem. I've got my, most of my best friends are women. 
Uh, and I adore men, you know, I've been married four times and I've lived with the same person for 10 years. It's uh, just that women do, you've got to recognise that men do things very differently. And in the book, I talk about the fact that men have a way of talking, they have words that they use that women, you know, really are, are right not to trust. Like the word soon. When you say to a man, will you do something? You say, I'll do it soon. Soon. And I assume means nothing. Soon means when I feel like doing it. To get ladies' attention, partly because I'm deeply unattractive, but secondly, because I don't understand women. How do I convince a lady that I'm actually interested in the nonsense she's talking, or I actually want to do the rubbish she wants to do, or I want to keep sending these texts back and forth saying, I love you, and aren't you gorgeous, and all this, when I don't? Do you really do all that? Well, it seems like you have to if you want to get a lady. Oh, well, I don't know, because I've never been any good at the courtship phase, ever. I've gone straight from uh, meeting someone to having sex on the first date, because if the sex is terrible, there's never going to be a second date. <laughs> so why waste time? Why waste time, yeah. Well, yes, that's why I say the book, the end of the book life's too short. Um, I only like men with a sense of humour who are highly intelligent. I think most women would say the same thing. They're not really, it's not really about looks. And you also want guys who seem relatively, and I use that word carefully, relatively straightforward and relatively uncomplicated. Having said that, all the men I've ever been with have been highly strung, very creative, deeply weird, you know. It's deeply weird. <laughs> Not really good. No, just in a kind of, you know, they're eccentric. I was in the pub last night with two of my cousins and we were discussing women and we were trying to get our heads around what you are and how you operate. Oh, I've got this image of three men in a pub. Already it sounds very unattractive. Depressing, isn't it? Yeah, very depressing. sad, I think it's the word. <laughs> and we all came to the conclusion that actually women are not interested in ooh, 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 ooh. They're just interested in companionship. Yeah, I think women want uh, a partner who's a friend. I think that when you... Uh, start a relationship you go through the sex phase and that lasts about three months might last a bit longer but in the end what you want is someone who's going to be there for you when you look looking great and you feel lousy and they're going to be sympathetic and they're going to be dependable and a lot of men find that quite a frightening commitment I love doing late night phone-ins. I've done them for years because you get really into people's psyche. You get a chance to talk to people who are probably in bed or alone and you get the real people Mm. calling you. And one thing that always fascinates me about ladies and help me with this is why they put up with a man that they don't like. It's low self-esteem. Most women honestly believe that if they dump the person they were with no one would ever find them attractive again or they might spend the rest of their lives alone whereas statistically what's happened is that when marriages now break down and when relationships end and the people are over 40 the women are by and large not remarrying and not finding another partner but the blokes they just go for the same thing but you know 10 years younger and men will always look Uh, for someone younger most men will whereas women that's one of the reasons why they've stuck with blokes who quite frankly aren't worth the effort because it's this fear of going into middle age and old age alone but I think that's really beginning to change because actually now the people that are big travellers big club members and people who go walking together are single women and it's a whole new market that advertisers and magazine publishers and people have realised is a growing uh, and a very important market. Going back to you very finely in your life today, what is your favourite thing to do? If you could be anywhere in the world now, where would you be? I'd be walking, probably by myself in Yorkshire on the, in the middle of the moors. quite like it when it's bad weather. <laughs> it's interesting that you say you'd rather be by yourself. Do you really mean that? I'd like to have someone waiting for me at the other end, but I love walking in a straight line. I've done loads of walks, long distance walking. I love it. I really, really love it. And I like, my perfect day would be walking all day, having a great big packed lunch, massive lunch, and probably, you know, a swig of wine, little doze under a tree or something, then stagger back on the road or on the path. Well, but, but my most favourite thing would be not on a path, uh, just in the middle of nowhere. And then at the end of the day, you know, fantastic, great big bed, white linen sheets, gorgeous dinner. 
It's interesting that in 2008, you choose to do something that's free and is available to us all that most of us now disregard and wouldn't even give two seconds to because it doesn't involve a TV or a computer or flying to Disney. Oh, no, my favourite, most relaxing thing is walking. Is that why you like to do it alone so you're not interrupted by somebody like me? I don't like people who talk on walks. (laughs) I don't like witterers. If you're a witterer, you're not coming on a walk with me. Um... I like having a very big goal. Like uh, once I did a TV series for the BBC where I walked from Edinburgh to London in a straight line. Um, I love doing that. And then I've done another series for the BBC where I've climbed all the mountains in Wales from uh, Cardiff to Conway. I love that kind of walking day on day. I really, really enjoy long distance walking. And I suppose what comes with that is the food and your fascination with healthy food and healthy living. Um, yeah. You've been a great champion of that recently. Has is, is that been inspired by the likes of Ramsay, who's made it so popular on TV? I don't like how Gordon cooks. That's one of the reasons why we make such good television programmes. I can't stand all that fiddle farting around on the plate, <laughs> all that dribbling all the sauces around and arranging the food up in a pyramid. Oh, no, it's a nightmare. I cook the way most women cook, which is I cook in a completely practical way and my food tastes great great but it's never going to look like a work of art on the plate you know because it's food it's not you know a jackson pollock disguised as sea bass um so i do enjoy cooking i do find it really really relaxing of course i couldn't cook i when i was at school i only did cookery for one term and then i did latin and i didn't really learn to cook till i was in my 20s and i was i and then i learned it from a book and I was pretty hopeless, but I gradually learnt it also from other friends. How difficult is it now being a woman in 2008? In your demographic, I'm sure it's easier than uh, if you go to a pit estate in Wigan. It seems to me socially we have some real problems still, and I, I do a lot of clubs and I see normal people, and life is still very hard for people, isn't it? I think life's very tough at the moment. People have run up credit card bills that are really big. Um... I think that is a problem, that people have been encouraged to go and buy things that they can't really afford and that they're going to spend forever paying off. So in terms of the rest of Europe, we've run up more debt per individual, more with credit cards than any other country in Europe. At the same time, I think that women think, oh, I want all this stuff. And then I would say back to them, for example, why do you buy so many ready meals? Why can't you see that if you just spent one or two nights a week making something to eat for yourself, you would enjoy it so much more? And if you can cook food from scratch, you could, it will cost you much, much less. And I'm not just being a middle class person saying that because that's how I cooked when I was a student and that's how I learnt to cook because I didn't have very much money and so I learnt to cook things from basic ingredients and I've never cooked ready meals just as I've never drunk Coca-Cola and I've never eaten a McDonald's you know I just think that life's too short to eat stuff like that and drink stuff like that because I really value the taste of things and I think the taste of really good food is as good as drugs you know it's just excellent and when you say that you think that there are women have a few problems i i think so too i think they're lonely they have low self-esteem and there's a lot of pressure on them to look ridiculous i mean who wants to look like victoria beckham do you want to live your entire life worried about whether you've eaten one prawn two prawns or five rocket leaves it's ludicrous We've got to say to women, enjoy the shape you are and the person you are. And that's why I wrote the book, because I feel it very, very, very strongly. They've got to stop wanting to be somebody else. How easy is that to convince somebody where they're probably working eight or nine hours a day and then they've got three kids to feed to actually learn to love themselves? They haven't got time, really, have they, to take that time out to love themselves? I think you've just got to allow yourself 10 minutes in the entire day. Even if it's 10 minutes when you read a book by yourself, 10 minutes where you have silence, 10 minutes when, you know, God knows I've done yoga and given it up and tried to meditate and failed. So, you know, I don't have a great desire to go back down that route. But I do believe in exercise and I do believe in doing simple weights or just sitting still and quiet for five minutes a day is really important. 
I think you're an inspiration. This book made me laugh more than anything because <laughs> well, it is that's funny. Good. <laughs> it is a comedy book. It is funny. But there are some real serious points that you make in it. And I think we're so cluttered today. That's the word for it. We've got so much going on. And actually, we put that on ourselves. We don't need to be as busy as we are. And I think there's something today that we like to think we're busy. We've got too many gadgets, for sure. And you just think, why have I got an electric toothbrush? Why have I got all this stuff? Why have I got, I got all this stuff? And you look at all these cameras and tape recorders and iPods and electric toothbrushes and you just think, you know, I, I, ha I talk in the book about getting rid of clutter. Some clutter's nice, like the mementos of members of your family that have died and, you know, old things that you've had for years and your school exercise. Everybody wants a bit of the past and that's comforting, but you don't need all this stuff. And all over Britain, people will be listening to this programme and they'll have stuff in garages, they'll have stuff in storage units. What for? I mean, I used to have three storage units. So what have I got all this crap for? <laughs> I can't go and live in a storage unit, so I just sold 